The Lord said, and as you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the selfish. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Oh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I mean, good morning, everyone. Kalimera we just heard a moment or two ago, the epistle reading today was Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Just in the title, Second Corinthians, we learn something phenomenal about our experience in Christ. But in order to qualify that, we have to take a step back and we have to make sure that we all understand exactly how the New Testament was constructed. What was the chronology of things? You see, before pen went to paper, what took place is there were apostles, formerly disciples of Jesus Christ, students, that then became apostles, individuals who were sent forth with a task. They were commissioned by God to go do something. And what they were commissioned to do was, one, to teach all nations what Jesus taught them, so to preach the gospel across the whole earth. And secondly, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see that in the gospel accounts at Jesus' ascent into heaven. And so, as I said, before anything was written down, you had these apostles who were going around and were orally delivering the gospel of Jesus Christ. You had St. Peter, you had St. John, you had St. James, St. Andrew. The apostles were going around and they were teaching people about the narrative of Jesus Christ. And then, as we read in Acts chapter 9, Saul, then called the Apostle Paul, was added to the group of apostles. He went to new places and he delivered to them the gospel. And then after he would go to place number one and he would deliver the gospel and found a church, he would then bring in clergy to service the community and Paul would go off and he would do the same thing somewhere new. Now even though they didn't have X 2,000 years ago, word still spread. And the Apostle Paul, after he had gone to one place and founded a church, by delivering the gospel, would go over here and he would start to hear that the first place that he was just at, they started messing up. They were doing things wrong. They were either believing or they were practicing things that were contrary to the gospel message that he had delivered to them not so long previously. And because he took very serious his commission as an apostle, he didn't just let it hang. He didn't say, well, I taught them well the first time. That's their fault if they're not getting it right now. What he would do is he would write a letter to them. And what you and I now refer to those letters, we call them epistles, the epistles of the New Testament. He would write a letter, and there was a purpose to each of these letters. It was to address these new Christian communities that he had founded that were now going astray in one capacity or another, and he was correcting them and re-instructing them because truth matters. You see, he delivered to them the gospel of truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if they start to stray away from truth, because truth matters, he had to correct them and re-instruct them back in the way of truth. Now, today we heard his second letter to the Corinthians. And I said, in the title, it teaches us something so profound about our Christianity. Paul went and founded the church in Corinth. He delivered to the Corinthians the gospel of Jesus Christ orally. 
And then, when he heard that they were getting it wrong, he sent them an epistle, a letter of correction and re-instruction. Why? Because truth matters. And then, more time goes by, and through the grapevine, he hears that they're still getting things wrong. He could have very easily said, hey, refer back to letter number one. But he didn't. He sends a second epistle, a second time. He engages that young Christian community to once again correct them, once again re-instruct them, and to do it with a little bit more stern tone in the text of his epistle. Why? Because truth matters. So you and I, we are those early Christians in Corinth. We call ourselves Christians. We've bought in that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross and was resurrected, all for our salvation. We understand that there's a church, which is the hospital to heal our souls. But guess what? And I put myself at the top of the list. We still make mistakes every day. And not only do we make mistakes, but we compound those mistakes. We call those sins. We compound them by oftentimes creating little justifications for those sins. Maybe even lying to ourselves and others by saying that that truth that we've been presented, Jesus, maybe it's a little outdated. Maybe didn't quite take into account contemporary dynamics and times. Maybe we're a little bit more enlightened now than when that truth was presented to us. And we can alter it a little bit to live a life that's a little bit more convenient, a life that's a little bit more indulgent. Perhaps we're seeking to live a life that's more guided and directed by our own will rather than God's will. Well, the church is here to remind each and every one of us, just as St. Paul, by writing those epistles 2,000 years ago, taught the early Christians that truth matters. What's right and wrong matters. What's good versus evil matters. And it matters not only in a philosophical way, it matters in terms of you and I getting into the kingdom of heaven. And so, a very short reminder, a very short continued correction and re-instruction for each of us who are inside of the church this morning. In the gospel reading which you heard Deacon John deliver this morning, we're told once again by Jesus himself that what you and I are called to is to love one another. We already know that. We've heard it in Scripture. We've probably been taught it by parents. I know that if you've ever been to church at St. Basil's before in the last decade, you've heard it over and over again. We're called to love one another. We're not called to love one another's behaviors, but we're called to love one another. And that means that we have to sacrifice for one another. It means even in its most basic yet powerful form that we should be praying for each other, sacrificing a little bit of time to uplift our fellow community members, to uplift our family members, to uplift the people in our society and beyond in prayer. Even and especially the ones whose behaviors we don't like the most. Yeah, the bad guys. We should be praying for them. That's the most basic way that we can love. And then when opportunities arise for us to love one another beyond uplifting each other in prayer, we have to strive to do so. You've heard that before, so have I. There's been times where I've done a decent job of it, just like I know that there's been times where you've done a good job at it. But I also know that there's been times where I've chosen not to love people. And if you're honest with yourself, you've done the same thing. St. Paul sent two letters back to the Christians in Corinth 
re-instructing and correcting them because truth matters. I'm offering a message that I've offered to you hundreds of times over the last nine years. We have to begin loving each other better than we ever have before. And the reason why I'm saying it again isn't because I don't have other messages to offer, but it's because truth matters, and that's the most basic truth of our Christian pilgrimage. Let Jesus Christ be present in our lives and witnessed in the way that we treat one another. Let us pray the continuation of this divine liturgy so that we may have the strength to love this week better than we ever have before. God will always be due the glory, and to us, the opportunity to love. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Kalimera. Just a few quick announcements before I invite everyone to receive Andidron from Father John. Uh, first and foremost, as I announced last week, I'll also remind everyone that tomorrow evening on the 30th begins our Orthodoxy 101, which is our Intro to Orthodoxy, our Inquirer's class that's taught by Deacon John. So that will be on campus tomorrow evening starting that series, that session. It's not only for those catechumens who are preparing to become Orthodox Christians, but even those of us that have been sitting in the pews for all of our life, it gives us a chance to either uh, brush up or perhaps learn something new. So I encourage all those who are able to join Deacon John on Monday evenings for the next several weeks to consider doing so and reach out to him for details. In addition, uh, on our campus, as you know, we've been speaking about the project to replace and upgrade our playground. And thanks to the beautiful gift uh, in her estate of Miss Julia Liddell, that will become a reality. We are now very, very close in the process of signing the contract for a brand new, beautiful playground, and it's even going to have shade. We're going to have shade. And so we're looking forward to that for our kids to be able to play on our campus and to be able to do it in a really safe environment where they're going to have a lot of fun here at God's house. In addition, dealing with our campus, as you know, we've had this never-ending project that now has finally come to completion where we've fenced in our entire campus and we've put electric gates at the entranceways as well. That was finally just completed. Now, anyone with a little bit of discernment knows that it's going to take our community uh, a little bit of a learning curve here because we're not used to having gates at having uh, closed gates at the entrances. And so if it becomes a little bit cumbersome at times, especially in these first couple of weeks, I ask for your patience. Just communicate with the church office if you're ever found trying to get into the church and the gate is closed. It's not because God doesn't love you. It's because we're getting used to the new system. Okay, so that's there. In addition, as many of you saw when you came to church today, you saw that we've now um, also invited a security experience onto our campus on Sunday mornings, which is a blessing that we're able to do so. And that will continue here at St. Basil's. And the last announcement that I have um, is to share with everyone and ask you to keep in your prayers one of the members of our community, Damon Diamantaris, who was just appointed by His Eminence Metropolitan Constantine as the president of the Metropolis Council. So what does that mean? The Metropolis Council is kind of like a parish council for the whole metropolis. And his position is like the president of the parish council for the whole metropolis. And so uh, His Eminence couldn't have chosen a better steward, a better faithful Orthodox Christian to serve in that role, to work together with him, our new hierarch, and we have lots of really exciting things that are coming just around the corner in the metropolis of Denver, building on the healthy foundations that we have. And I share that so that you can maintain Damon in your prayers as he takes on this new ministerial role. May the good Lord continue to bless him, our metropolis, Metropolitan Constantine, and all of us here at St. Basil's this day and always. Please come forward to receive Andidram from Father John and go about your week in peace. God bless us all.